Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to this engineering um, Q and A. This is a part of our monthly series uh, that we do at Plato here. That we call the engineering Q and As. We have an incredible speaker uh, today. Some a really interesting uh, topic uh, to discover about quality and how they do this at Figma. So, welcome, uh, Chris, uh, CTO of Figma. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me, JB. Cool. Um, well, we, we're going to get started uh, quickly about myself as well. Uh, my name is JB. I'm, I'm the co-founder at Plato. We are the mentorship platform for engineering leaders, and we host those Q&As um, every month. So without further ado, um, Chris, let's roll. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Chris. I'm currently the CTO at Figma and previously the VP of engineering there. Um, fun fact about me is I actually joined Figma as a contractor. Um, so I was taking some time off and started doing some technical advising and consulting and actually uh, worked with Figma just writing code for the first eight months and had a ton of fun. So I ended up joining full time. Um, before Figma, I was the uh, engineering lead and an early engineer at Asana. Uh, I also served in various engineering leadership roles at companies like um, Aptana, uh, and also my own company, which was called Rivalsoft back in the day. Uh, for fun, I like to tinker with 3D printers. That's probably what you would consider one of my, my geekier hobbies. I like to do some amateur robotic stuff. And I also spend a lot of time writing graphics and game engines and playing around with physics engines just, just to have fun. Um, this is actually a screenshot from a, a little surfing simulator I was working on before I joined Figma. It's actually one of the things that, that led me to the company and got me so excited about working at a company like Figma. Um, but most of the time these days, I'm actually just hanging out with my wife and my one-year-old daughter, Grace, who you can see here. Um, before we get into the q and I just want to give you a little bit of background about the company uh, and also leave you with just a couple quality uh, learnings that we've, we've kind of developed over the years. Um, so many of you probably already know us for Figma Design. It's an all-in-one design platform for teams who are creating products from start to finish. Uh, in 2021, we also launched our second product, which is FigJam. It's an online whiteboard for teams. You can use it for real-time brainstorms, engineering diagrams, and, and all sorts of stuff. The company is currently around 1,000 employees, and about one-third of those are inside of the functions that I'm responsible for. So that's data science, engineering, security, um, and, and so on. Um, one, one other kind of fun fact is I, we have about one-third engineering within the company, and it turns out our weekly active users are also about one-third uh, engineers. So we really think of ourselves as building software for entire product teams, not just design teams. Um, just to kind of frame the conversation, I want to talk a little bit about kind of how we think about quality at Figma. Um, so I'll start with just like a, a, you know, probably an overly complicated definition. Um, so the, the way we sort of conceptualize quality is it's inversely related to the sum of the bad experiences that your users face. I think it's worth noting that it's not just about reducing the bad experiences. Obviously, you want to catch as many things as you can in tests and in your staging environments before they go to production, but things are going to slip through. And so it's also about reducing the severity of those things that slip through your time to detect and remediate those issues and the number of users that get exposed to any given issue at any given time. And when we talk about bad experiences at Figma, we're thinking about all sorts of things. I, I think a lot of people immediately jump to bugs and exceptions or data loss or reliability issues. Um, but we also think a lot about performance, given that we're a professional design tool. And we also think about the feature limitations that we might have launched with and, and how we need to fast follow those with improvements over time. And we think a lot about ease of use as well. So one of the things we say at Figma is always sweat the details or a very detail-oriented culture and company. Uh, I think this is a function of our, our kind of primary initial user base, which are designers who are also very detail-oriented. Designers deserve some of the best experiences because they're trying to create the best experiences, and they're also some of the toughest critics. So quality is something that we just cannot ignore at Figma. Um, when designers can't work and the product teams around them can't work, then it's you know they can't do their job without Figma. So it's, it's really important that Figma is always available and responsive. And we're also sort of working against this myth at Figma that the web can't deliver high performance professional tools. Um, back when even I joined Figma, I was a little skeptical that you could build a professional grade design tool in the browser. Um, but I was really excited to see the team had already proven me wrong. And this is something that we're really passionate about. And then last and not least, we really, really care about quality as a part of our product brand and our company culture, and especially our engineering culture. I think we all feel much more pride in what we're doing if we're, if we're, proud, we're proud of the details as well. Um, some of the things that actually make quality a little bit more challenging at Figma is, is some, some aspects of our relatively deep technology stack. Um, so 
many of you probably already know this, but some of you might not. Uh, we have our own renderers at Figma, so we don't rely on sort of the standard browser renderers for our canvas surface where, where designers are iterating on their own designs. Um, and that comes with a, a huge slew of challenges in terms of supporting a wide array of hardware combinations and GPUs and really just making sure that um, every little detail with our renderer is right. We're also early adopters of um, lower level browser APIs like WASM and WebGL. Um, and we use a lot of C++ on the web, which is pretty atypical for most companies. And there's a lot of issues with just using C++, right? Um, but it's really important to us because it gives us access to native libraries and enables us to squeeze every last ounce of performance and, and lower memory limits. Um, we have some pretty deep um, technologies around materializing design files, which tend to be much larger than the average website. Um, and, you know, taking advantage of things like our new component and parameter features that can actually end up creating a file in memory that's much larger than it is on disk. Um, these technologies are called scene graph um, for us. And then, of course, we're pretty well known for our multiplayer functionality. It's really important to us that everything you do in Figma can be done with other people in real time. Um, Co-creation is, is a really important aspect of our products, and um, it goes beyond just the browser. It's, it's also about building reliable distributed systems that are eventually consistent, um, never lose data, but stream it as quickly as possible. And all of this is sort of compounded by just like the unique nature of the, the product space we're in. Um, the features tend to be very deep and complex. There's just sort of an essential level of complexity that a professional designer needs to get their job done. We've also had pretty consistent and rapid growth of users and our own engineering team, which, which comes with its own set of challenges. And then at Figma, we actually do a lot more all or nothing launches than I think you know, typical web companies do. Um, whenever we can, we, we roll things out in experiments and we do private betas and all of that. Um, but we also really value just giving all of our users the same new features at the same time so they can all talk about it together. So before we switch over to the q and I'm just going to leave you all with three learnings that we have figured out over, over time. Um, the first one is around bug reporting. So in the early years of Figma, we didn't have a very robust and well-defined bug process. We had a single QA engineer at the time who was sort of doing the global triage and, and funneling bugs to different teams. And there was just a lot of ambiguity and uh, anxiety around whether or not we were above or below this, this relatively ambiguous quality bar. And so we took a look at what was going on in, in the backlog of bugs. And we realized that there was like one change in particular that was going to be pretty meaningful. Um, and that is to prioritize new bugs and regressions higher. In fact, we actually basically uh, have a rule that new bugs and regressions need to be driven towards zero at all times. Um, and so what I mean by new bugs and regressions are like if you're doing some feature work or you're releasing um, some new uh, improvements, if you break something in the process of doing that and it gets found out shortly after breaking it, like within the first three months, then regardless of how severe that issue is, it's really useful to just fix it in that moment when the team still has context, um, when users are really paying attention to the trade-offs you're making between new features and quality. Um, those are the sorts of things that just accumulate so quickly over time if you ignore them. And before this, what we had been doing is really just like prioritizing our bug list purely based on priority, which meant that there were some pretty like long-standing older bugs that had maybe taken a, a while to detect, but were really hard to fix that were consuming all of the time around fixing bugs. And so these, these smaller regressions that we were doing through the course of the early feature development were accumulating much more quickly than we felt comfortable with. And so this was like a, a pretty big shift and it felt like a really high bar for the team at first, but the, the company embraced it and we've, we've moved this forward ever since. And then for those longer standing regressions, the issues that maybe you don't find out about for three months, the, the thinking here is that if it took that long to figure it out, then we can prioritize it alongside all of the other work we're doing. So it's not that we don't care about it. Sometimes we figure out something really bad and we do have to fix it that day. It's a blocker bug. But in many cases, we treat it just as like a normal priority bug and we'll fix it you know, by the end of the quarter or in one of our quality weeks. Um, quality weeks is something that's worked really well for us. Um, so the idea here is basically like three times a quarter, approximately every team schedules a, a quality week and they, they do some work to sort of curate their backlog of bugs, um, the, the longer standing bugs that took a while to figure out. And they try to figure out ways to basically rally the team around fixing various themes of bugs and then work with our PMM team to actually celebrate that and show our users that we care about these details. The second learning I want to share is just, uh, 
really facing frustrated users head on. Um, in the early days of Figma, we sort of took it for granted that everyone on the engineering team was you know, also doing support, also talking to customers. Um, and as the company continued to scale, it just became overwhelming to try to stay on top of that as an engineering team. And so we improved our support function and, and grew it to be larger. And at a certain point, we became pretty insulated from some of these issues. They're always being sort of like translated um, through a game of telephone back to the engineering team. Um, and so I think there's definitely some benefit to this, right? You can't have an engineer, you know, triaging the same issues over and over and talking to every single customer. Um, but there's also a downside in that you, you sort of lose sight of like what's actually going on. And you sort of start to get, you know, almost a little bit lazy, if you will, around waiting for like clear reproduction steps to come to you. And so um, one of the things that I think uh, Dylan and, and Sho, who's our, one of our VPs of product, do really well is they're actually always on Twitter, on forums, listening to users and reading what people are talking about. And we frequently find that customers are reporting um, real issues that we haven't yet discovered ourselves. Maybe there's a gap in our telemetry or our monitoring, or maybe we know there's an issue, but we're just not exactly sure what unique circumstances are triggering it. And so now what we try to do as an engineering team is we try to actually look for these things, these sort of needles in the haystack, if you will. And, and we actually go reach out to these customers and we try to talk to them directly um, very quickly. Sometimes we'll do it through Twitter and we'll work with our community support team to, to facilitate a, a Zoom call or something like that. Um, but we've actually been able to like much more rapidly diagnose some of the like scary but hard to reproduce issues in Figma um, and learned a lot and, and it's made some pretty big improvements to quality as a result. And the last learning I want to leave everyone with is this idea of golden cohorts. Uh, we talk about this a lot at Figma, ranging from just like kind of standard business metrics and golden cohorts around that, but also quality metrics like performance. Um, the evolution of sort of a, a typical software team is you, you don't have a lot of production monitoring at first. Um, and so you might, you know, when you do get some production performance monitoring, you might index on these sort of averages and debate whether or not it should be P50, P75, P90. As you evolve, you might start looking at those distributions more completely to understand what the variance performance is for your users. But even if you do all of that, it's still kind of ambiguous what it means for P90 to be a lot higher than you know P50 uh, or whatnot. And, and the reason it's ambiguous is you're just lumping so many different usages of, of your product and so many different types of users of your product um, into these cohorts. Oftentimes, like the, the users that matter most, especially if you have like a product-led kind of freemium business model, are not going to be the most dominant, even in these higher percentiles. And so when you start to like realize that these users are actually facing real issues that you need to fix, they're not just like pushing edge cases in unreasonable ways. Um, you have to start to think about how do you actually measure their usage more specifically. And so this is kind of the idea around a golden cohort. cohort. Um, you want to start to segment your, your performance metrics and your quality metrics around these important use cases, user behaviors, and user types. Um, so that it's much more intuitive when you see a problem there, what could be going on, and you have a real user, again, that you can go reach out to um, who can tell you a bit more about what they're doing. So this has been super helpful for us. So in summary, prioritize new bugs and regressions higher. Talk directly to your frustrated users. I know it's scary, but they often end up being your biggest advocates and the ones most willing to help. And take the time to think about who your golden cohorts are and how you can better segment your metrics to make them more intuitive and actionable. That's it for me, and I, we can start the Q and A now. Awesome! Thanks a lot, Chris, for this get of tidbits of, of information about quality uh, at Figma and how you guys handle stuff. Um, it feels like you've been you've gone fast on, on a few things, and I think this is perfect because we're gonna we're gonna be able um, to see the kind of questions that the the, the audience is is asking. So I'm gonna give everyone a little bit of, of, of time. There's already some questions there that you can upvote. Feel free to add your own. Uh, you know we have uh, you know close to half an hour, so you know, we will have time to cover uh, a, a lot of questions here. And so as everyone can add their first questions or, or upvote, um, maybe I can start with one of my questions. Um, and some of the things that you started you started to mention um, performance engineering. Um, and I, I think it would be interesting to kind of, you know, uh, dig a little bit more uh, from feedback perspective. What does this mean? And, and um, you know, yeah, what it is, generally speaking. Yeah. Um... So I, I think, yeah, there's a lot more to performance engineering than, than just defining golden cohorts. Um, I alluded to some of it, but, um, you know, it's been sort of like an ever evolving process within Figma. 
there's still parts of Figma that are too slow, especially in some of these large files when, when customers are pushing the limit. And so we're always looking for ways to improve it. Um, some of the stuff that we do do right now is we, uh, we actually do have performance tests. Um, so in the early days of Figma, performance okay. tests were basically like these tests that just kind of um, sort of like integration tests that tried to use Figma in these interactive ways so that we could measure serious regressions in frame rate or frame times. Um, these tests actually ran on just like a, a single laptop um, that I think ran in a closet. And uh, they were they were definitely useful, but it was a little hard to kind of catch everything with the tests because they weren't challenging enough to catch the kinds of regressions that actually um, maybe wouldn't be detected upon like initial staging usage or something like that. And it only would be detected in some of the, the kind of extreme use cases that were still very valid, um, but weren't things that engineers were thinking about. Um, over time, those tests sort of atrophied. The uh, the performance laptop itself actually started to bend from overheating, and we actually got rid of them. And we, we kind of ran blind for a long time, and we started to focus much more on like per- production telemetry and all this sort of stuff. Um, more recently, we've brought back performance tests. We've made them run on every CI commit, and we've we've actually rethought them in such a way that we actually try to like figure out what are like the right usage patterns to be indexing on, what are sort of the critical performance use cases. But then we figure out how to actually stretch those use cases to their limits so that if someone changes like the runtime characteristics of the application in a subtle but meaningful way, those performance tests are going to be very noisy and very loud, um, or I should say very loud without being as noisy. Um, so this has actually helped us catch a number of regressions in the, the last couple months, um, something that we're really benefiting from. Um, and then on top of that, we, we also have a lot of different slices and dices of production metrics. Um, so every team has their own kind of performance telemetry dashboards where they sort of highlight the, the kind of different use cases they care about. Um, and then one of the things we're working on now is trying to figure out how to aggregate these these sort of like performance regressions across all these dashboards. So we have this like higher level metric that we can index on, measure features against, and, and kind of measure the overall company progress against. That's good. It's, uh, what stage was the was the the bending laptop? <laughs> what was the what was the question? The date? What stage of the company? Oh yeah, yeah. I think it was like the stage uh, of the company. It got introduced in probably like 2016, shortly after our, our first public launch, and then um, I think okay. I think the laptop bent a little too much by like 2018, 2019. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so you kind of still lasted a long time. Cool. Thank you for for sharing about performance. Uh, and so let's start with one uh, question from from the audience. So from uh, Pavel Ivanov, what's your experience with manual testing and test cases at Figma, and how did the approach evolve over the years? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Lots of votes on this one. So everyone's interested about manual testing. Yeah. So I don't want to sound overly opinionated. Um, I, I think that there, there are definitely benefits to manual testing. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about how it's evolved and, and where we're at today. So when I joined Figma, um, it was a relatively small engineering team, I think on the order of like 12 to 15 engineers. And um, there was one QA engineer um, who was doing pretty much all of the manual testing. Um, I think it's worth noting that, like, you know, when you go to these talks, you hear about how companies do things today, you know, after they've already had a years to figure stuff out and, and you know, very specific yeah. circumstances that they need to optimize around. But in the early days of Figma, just to be honest, we didn't have that many tests, not even like uh, automated tests. Um, I think it was more about figuring out product market fit. Um, team was really small. Uh, there's a few people writing most of the code. And so um, they deprioritized uh, as much like rigorous automated testing. And so we relied a lot on manual testing in the early days. Um, okay. And it worked. It, it certainly helped when the team was small. Um, eventually, that person reported to me, and um, they were pretty candid with me that, hey, look, like everyone thinks I'm testing everything, but I'm not. <laughs> like, I can't possibly <laughs> test everything anymore. <laughs> it's changing way too fast. And so I think it gave everyone this sense of safety, but it was in some sense artificial. And so we actually made the intentional decision to move that person into a product management role. And we, uh, we sort of de-invested, if you will, in QA engineering at that time. Um, and this was definitely like a, a kind of scary moment for the company, but it, it really forced engineers to own quality themselves and really reason about edge cases and, and do their own manual testing through the course of their feature development. And so it certainly didn't come without some road bumps, but over time we got better at it. And today we don't rely on QA engineers to do manual testing. We actually only have one QA engineer across an organization of over 300 now. Um, and they're really focused on trying to kind of up-level quality processes, um, reason about quality themes. It's a more strategic role rather than a tactical testing role. 
Um, with all that said, okay. I think there's still a time and a place for manual testing, um, especially if you're targeting a lot of different platforms um, or if you're on a, a platform that doesn't enable you to fix things extremely quickly. Um, so we're actually looking at uh, bringing more manual testing into some of our mobile clients and, and our desktop environments as well. Okay, cool. Thanks for, for sharing. You're not opinionated, but the, the, the things you've implemented show some strong opinions still on, on, on manual testing. Um, thank you for, for sharing. So next question is from Mike. With such a UI-heavy application, how much are you able to leverage uh, automated testing? Any tips, tools for doing more with automation? So I think good transition uh, from the previous question. Yeah, yeah. So to be honest, we were, we were a little late to the game with integration testing. Um, I think that probably came about a couple years after I joined, so maybe around like 2018. Um, and that is because we have this relatively unique technical stack. In the early days, it was like entirely written in C++. We eventually migrated the, the Chrome um, to React to, to leverage a lot of the great open source stuff. Um, but our Canvas is actually pretty hard to test with any sort of open source um, automation framework. And so... Um, we, we relied more on in unit tests and, and various things in the early days. Um, but at one point, an engineer sort of took initiative on, on his own to actually figure out how to, to build what we call interaction tests in the context of our editor surface areas. Um, and so now we have a pretty robust interaction testing framework that allows you to interact with the Figma application and actually record your actions. And then it outputs code that you can then kind of simplify and, and write as a as if it's a unit test, but it actually runs as an integration test um, through continuous integration and, and you know, you ensure that you're not regressing things as your PRs get merged into master. Um, so, yeah, so we have our own sort of internal tool. And then we also use like open source tools for, for some of the more standard stuff. Um, we have like a, what we call a prober framework now that tests a lot of the, the kind of key user flows um, and uh, sort of P0, P1 um, operations and requests in Figma. Um, and it does this uh, primarily in our staging environment, in our production environment. Um, but we're also looking at doing more of that stuff in our CI environment as well. Um, the challenge with our CI environment is it's it's gotten relatively complex, like to run our entire tech stack. And so we have to get creative in terms of how we actually um, ensure that those are running on each PR. Um, but that's what we're working on right now. Cool. Uh, thanks for sharing. So a lot of investment in, in kind of, you know, uh, homemade kind of tools uh, to, to cope with the specificity of the product. So it's super interesting. Um, so the, the next question is about uh, product. Uh, so, and it's from uh, Ishot. Um, just don't want to mispronounce names. Uh, how do you align the product priorities at Figma with the quality goals? Often product managers are not incentivized to prioritize performance quality work. Yeah, that's that's an awesome question. I'm I'm glad you asked this because I wanted to talk about it. Um, <laughs> I, I think like I alluded to this earlier in my intro, but um, quality really is sort of a, a top down priority for Figma every single quarter, every single year. Um, in the early kind of planning years, we weren't very creative, uh, so we would actually just say like our priority is quality. <laughs> but uh, as we've gotten a little more refined with our planning processes, we start to be more specific about the quality outcomes we're trying to create this quarter or this half. Um, so uh, right now, for example, we have a, a performance outcome. Um, we've realized that as the team has grown, uh, it's, it's harder and harder to kind of diagnose and quickly remediate even small performance regressions. And so we're, we're doing sort of like a, a cross-cutting initiative around the company to really invest in more of these sort of qual uh, performance smoke tests that run in CI um, and, and shore up some of our metrics and reporting and build these higher level aggregate metrics so that we can kind of have a common way of holding teams accountable um, and, and establishing that cultural bar. Um, so it's always a top-down initiative, and I think it really starts at the top at Figma. Um, as I mentioned, Dylan is, uh, is really, I think, like one of the things he's incredibly good at is just having a pulse on the community and really paying attention to their needs. And so he's uh -huh. like not afraid to relay concerns from important users or just even like, you know, random users of Figma on Twitter if it feels like something that we don't understand or we're not on top of. That sounds good. Cool. Thank you for for sharing also about the the prior priorities. Um, and, and how how do you rely on on the community also to to align with those? Do do they trigger sometimes like new priorities um, at Figma, or is it more like the feedback loop once you you know you you're done with with some stuff? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, they, they do trigger new priorities at Figma. Um, I, as I mentioned, like designers are, uh, I think, very vocal about their needs, which is awesome. Like that's what you want as a company. And they're uh-huh. also really great at articulating it at times. So we definitely take advantage of that. Um, we try to pay attention to, to what, you know, key users are saying and what themes we're seeing. Um, and we respond accordingly. And then, as I mentioned, like um, a lot of us, myself included, like I get on, if you actually look at my Twitter account, it's basically Figma support. Um, I'll just go on, Twi- <laughs> on Figma at night when I'm bored and I'll find like an issue that I don't feel like I or the team understands yet. And I'll try to DM the person and see if we can get on a Zoom and, and diagnose it. And oftentimes that's actually turned into like a, a revelation in terms of an architectural change we need to make to get the, per- the product to that kind of next level of performance or to handle that next level of large files or large design systems. All right. So if people want to talk to you on Twitter, they know what to do. Report bugs. <laughs> and I hope yeah. that... Uh, It'll eventually come back to me, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, also just standard support is good too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Let's use support. Um, thank you. So next question by, by Mick. Um, so it's, uh, Mick is asking about your testing pyramid. Uh, so manual testing, end-to-end testing, integration testing, functional testing, and unit testing. Yeah, um, I don't think I have like the most formalized uh, terminology to talk about this. So I'll just try to kind of rattle off all the different things that we do and then feel free to ask questions if I'm, uh, if I'm using wrong terminology or there's a particular kind of test you're curious about. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we still do manual testing, but it's done by engineers. So I think it's actually really important for engineers to, to like think about the edge cases of the experiences they're creating, especially for like a complex design tool like Figma. And so every engineer has their own staging environment. They can also spin up development environments for other people to provide early feedback. And they're, you know, trying to kind of poke around and play with the features that they're building so they can understand what the kind of key use cases are and, and, and what the actual key edge cases are as well. Um, so that's kind of like the first step of the process. It's really just, a, a, you know, building a culture around actually using the things you build um, and really thinking about like, you know, um, the ways in which some of this complexity you're introducing can compound over time and, and create these sort of, um, you know, unexpected uh, edge cases. And from there, uh, we sort of move to um, this, uh, this sort of bug bash process across teams. Um, so we also have this sort of manual process where a team before they'll launch a feature, they'll schedule a bug bash. They'll invite sort of all the cross-functional stakeholders and anyone else who wants to join. And we'll create a fig jam file or something like that to just make it really easy to rapidly collect um, feedback and concerns and bugs that might have come up. And then we'll kind of move that all over to our bug tracking system so it doesn't get lost. Um, so again, like I'm talking about the manual things because I actually think they are really important. I think it's really important to have an intuition for, for what you're actually building versus just, you know, codifying some of the tests that you, you thought of right, right when you started the feature. Um, and then throughout the development process, everyone is also writing unit tests. They're using our integration testing framework to build these UI tests. Um, depending on the nature of the product, they might also be building these sort of like, um, you know, uh, integration tests that kind of span client and server behaviors. Um, And then for very specialized kind of platform initiatives, we have like a whole slew of kind of specialized testing for things like um, eventual consistency, um, multiplayer race conditions, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, So there's a lot of specialized testing too. Uh, On top of that, we also have um, these sort of like invariant enforcers. So we're always trying to kind of assert that invariants are preserved in CI. Um, but sometimes we'll discover that, you know, maybe there's some crazy multiplayer edge case we hadn't uh, anticipated that can introduce some form of like uh, awkward data um, that the application is actually not tolerant of yet. And so first we'll try to like, you know, fix the issue and, and make the application tolerant of it. And then we'll actually introduce um, this sort of invariant checker that runs asynchronously on all files and reports um, issues so that we can see if we're actually you know, improving the situation or if it's getting worse and maybe we didn't actually identify the root cause. Um, And then uh, we have a staging environment where we use all of our software ourselves. Um, We're definitely big users of of Figma Design and FigJam. Um, We use it for for all sorts of things across functions, not just design. And so um, we have like a pretty standard and simple way to report bugs in Slack. Um, and that, that also helps us kind of understand, you know, where did we not actually have sufficient test coverage? Um, where do we miss an edge case, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we, um, we will go to production, but typically we first go to a private beta because as I mentioned, oftentimes we're releasing things all at once. And so we'll use that as a way of not just identifying new bugs, but also, you know, identifying maybe um, design issues and things that are unintuitive or things that could be improved more generally 
Um, and then once things are in production, um, we have like a set of these, uh, these probers, if you will, which are sort of like um, production integration tests, I think is the right word. Um, and they're sort of testing our key flows and making sure that we identify any um, significant issues or regressions in performance or availability as quickly as possible before our users report it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'd say like we, we lean very heavily on unit tests. We have like a really unique and robust uh uh, integration testing framework, if you will. Um, that's the thing that the engineer made around 2018. Um, so it allows you to record interactions and also, um, you know, put those in your code and check them into your code base. And it does it in a way where it's actually somewhat invariant to subtle changes in the UI. So they're not always brittle. Um, and then we, we, you know, we do a lot of manual testing, bug bashes, that sort of stuff as engineers and, and product managers. Uh, and then we also like monitor all of our production infrastructure. Every team has dashboards and um, quality reports and things like that so that we can catch things that, that slip through the cracks. Cool. Thank you for the, for, for the detailed, uh, detailed answer. I think this is exactly what uh, Mick was, uh, was expecting. So thank you very much, uh, Chris. So next question is, it's not about quality. Uh, and it's about uh, hiring uh, at Figma and just knowing if you have like specific traits uh, that you're looking for, looking for when you're hiring engineers. Um, the question is also if you have specific like designer front end background uh, also. Yeah. Um... So I think like we do probably look for specific traits, but I think the way we think about it more is like, is this person excited about um, embracing a certain set of values more so than, you know, you know, do they like very clearly uh, fit this particular mold? Um, and so uh, I think some of the values that we're looking for is one intellectual curiosity, right? So I think one of the things that's made us successful at Figma is even though we have like deep domain experts, we try not to be kind of um, restricted by our domain and we encourage people to, to kind of seek out um, learnings across domains. And so like, you know, within Figma, right, it's, it's sort of a, it's a web based company, but we also have used C plus plus and these, you know, low level graphics APIs to, to really improve our product and give us that competitive edge and do things that I think, frankly, other people hadn't really done on the web yet. And so we're looking for people who are excited about those challenges and, and want to embrace this sort of cross-functional, cross-domain learning. Um, with that said, we still definitely embrace domain experts and we, we you know, we need them. Um, but we want people who are just generally intellectually curious and, and try to really understand not just how what they're working on works, but how the things around it work. We look for examples of that. Um, I think the other thing that we look for are people who, like, understand the value of lifting each other up rather than just defaulting to being competitive. I think as engineers, uh, I don't know about all of you, but I was pretty insecure early on. I was always trying to kind of validate that I actually knew what I thought I knew. And I think that can lead to this very competitive kind of traditional Silicon Valley environment. And so one of the things that really stood out for, for me when, when I was a contractor at Figma was just how intentional everyone was about not falling into that trap and, and lifting each other up. And so um, we're looking for uh, examples of that and, and signs that that's something that someone wants to embrace. Um, and then when it comes to kind of designer front end background, I mean, the, the reality is like Figma is a very complex distributed system. I know it doesn't look like that on the surface, um, but there's some really, really hard infrastructure problems at Figma too. It's just, that's actually my background um, outside of this, this whole game engine thing that I did for a while. Um, I spent a lot of my time working on distributed systems and that's one of the things that attracted me to Figma. So we don't like just focus on, you know, front end engineers. In fact, we try to hire full stack engineers by default, unless we really need a domain specialist. Um, and we, we, we like to hire people who like, you know, the full stack of problems. Um, and then I think we also work very collaboratively and cross-functionally. Uh, I think it's easy to kind of just assume like design does this and engineering does that. Uh, in the early days of Figma, we had very few designers and a lot more engineers. And so we all kind of wore different hats and that's over the years. So we like to, to kind of work with people who are um, e eager to do that. It's not a requirement um, depending on where you are in the stack, but it's definitely something we embrace and encourage. Cool. Thank you for um, sharing. And, and I think through this answer, you, it seems that you also kind of shared, uh, you know, company values, I'm guessing, or at least engineering team, team values. And so the, the next question I want to um, uh, go is, I think it's two of them are really talking about the importance of the culture uh, for, for, for quality. So Rupal said that a typical mindset of engineers to get features shipped versus shipping quality code to production. How do we infl influence giving quality importance and build that culture? And I think there's another question that is, how do you add quality to the company culture? So I think those two kind of go together. Yeah. Um, 
So I, you know, one of the things I've, I've kind of learned from, from friends over the years is that it's like, uh, especially in the early days of a startup, um, you don't want to in- over index on like how to do something. You just want to figure out, like, you just want to make it happen. So, um, to be honest with you, I probably haven't always been the most leveraged and effective at doing this. Um, a lot of times it's just me poking at it. Um, so from the early days, you know, I, I'm the one, uh, you know, me and Dylan and, and others are looking at the support forums, looking at Twitter, surfacing issues to teams, um, digging into them ourselves, leading by example, that sort of thing. Um, you can get a long ways with that. And, and honestly, like it's, mm-hmm. it's act- yeah. sometimes even more efficient than, than trying to think about all the process stuff you need to do as you get bigger. Um, as we've gotten bigger, we, we've definitely had to get more structured with this. So, I mean, a couple of tricks that I personally learned that work well is first off, just like figuring out how to kind of roll up these quality metrics, standardize the processes around quality into almost just like a scorecard across teams. I mean, we literally actually have a quality scorecard across all of our teams at Figma. And I look at that every single week with the engineering leadership group, just to show that it's something that we actually care about, right? It's not like I actually have to look at it every week, but if I don't look at it every week, then it's easier for someone to realize or to assume that I don't care that their bug count is getting a little high and and assume that I would rather them just ship this feature as quickly as possible. And so um, by, by forcing myself and others to look at it, we show from the top down that this is something we care about and we follow up when when the numbers don't look right. Um, and that sorts, sort of helps to kind of force course correct any sort of value trade-offs that a given team might not um, be comfortable making on their own. Um, that's the first step. And then the other thing we do is um, we, we run these quality weeks, which I, I mentioned in the intro. Um, so we sort of like, it's like a given that a team is going to have a set of quality weeks in a quarter, especially if they're like a, a product facing team. Um, and we use these these quality weeks to not just like, you know, drive quality forward, but actually to celebrate the wins and, and show that it's like really fun to fix bugs. Like, honestly, like, I think a lot of people lose sight of the fact that as products mature, um, you definitely need to keep innovating, but each little change you make is maybe like a little bit like less, ex- less of a, it's a little bit more of like a diminishing return in some sense, um, or at least like less meaningful than actually fixing some of the issues that your users have been facing for a long time. And so for me, like when I look at a, a support forum and, and people are frustrated about something that I know that we should have fixed a while ago. It just, it, it does, I'm not proud of what we're doing. And I, and I try to like, um, you know, make sure that the team knows that too. And I, and I know the team feels the same way. So I think quality is a top down thing. Um, and then, yeah, when it comes to like making it more formal as your company gets bigger, I think you can create, you know, a lot of companies will create these sort of outcomes. Like here's the things that leadership wants to see this quarter. And we always have some quality sort of cent- quality centric outcome. <laughs> Super interesting. I, I like the, the kind of leading by example as, as you're small as, as as a company I think is a is a good takeaway. And then as you grow, it's just kind of it, it kind of starts from the top as well in in some other ways through as you said metrics and 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 focus. But um, no, thanks for for sharing. And so you you mentioned during uh, to answer when you answered that previous question, you mentioned the quality weeks. You, you talked about it before and we actually have a question about it so uh the question is how frequently are teams doing quality weeks and, and i think you answered this is, is three per quarter um but i think we could extend a little bit on quality weeks and could you tell us a little bit more like you know what what's the goal how does it set up what's kind of the agenda for for, for a team like what are they doing during those those weeks specifically yeah, well, first off, I, I want to say that this was like a bottoms up initiative. So this was not me doing something. Even better. Down. This is something that yeah. the team wanted to do themselves. It was actually like a, a joint effort between the design team and the engineering team. Um, the, the great news is like our designers are users of our products. And so they're also complaining when there's quality issues. Um, so that definitely helps to reinforce the culture. Um, but yeah, so the, the way they work uh, is that um, we sort of have this like, You can schedule them whenever you want, but generally the guidance is three per quarter for these uh, product-facing teams. And um, the engineering manager and the the design leads and all the XFN leads sort of work together to kind of pre-curate the backlog of longstanding bugs that um, didn't necessitate immediate fixes, um, but are still important to fix. And they, they try to kind of like look at the backlog in terms of like common themes and and try to pull out some of those themes so that it doesn't feel like you're just fixing a one-off small issue. But if you fix these issues in aggregate, you're going to have like a a much bigger effect on the perception of um, quality for the end user. Um, So they'll look for those themes. And then we give the team guidance that if a a particular bug is going to take more than a week, then 
we should just plan to fix that as part of our normal product road mapping process. So that, okay. that should just kind of go into the, the kind of sprint process and, and be prioritized accordingly. Um, the goal of the quality week is actually to make a lot of progress on a lot of things to, to really kind of keep that bug count from growing indefinitely. And so we try to orientate the team towards things that they can fix quickly um, within that one week time frame. And then um, we oftentimes do some sort of celebration around it. Um, I think when I was a contractor, I received like a, a, a Koality bear. It was like a stuffed animal. Um, oh, wow. Teams have continued that tradition <laughs> over the years. And uh, and then we, we actually package up the, the improvements we make and we do um, these sort of like quality launches uh, with our PMM team to, to celebrate it and recognize it. Nice. Nice. Really, there's some, some good things here to, to take in and maybe try to implement in our own teams here for people in the, in, in the audience. Um, I think that we have like less than five minutes left. So, you know, just a, a couple of questions. And one is, a, so it's, it's, it's a large topic. It's how do you manage to take that at Figma? So, you know, I guess we could do another <laughs> engineering Q&A about this, but uh, feel free to share some of like, you know, quick learnings and, and, and generally speaking, your, how you manage your tech tap. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, um, all the stuff I'm saying about quality weeks and bug triage and stuff equally applies to tech debt. Um, tech debt leads to quality problems. It also leads to, you know, I think cultural branding problems. Like I think everyone wants to be proud of their quality bar and their code base. Um, so I think you can kind of generalize a lot of the stuff I've said to tech debt as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, for us, um, one of the things we do realize is that there is this tension between shipping and improving tech debt. And in the early days, um, we sort of asked everyone to think about both simultaneously. We're like, tech debt is super important. Product work is important. Bugs are important. Like, you have to think about them all equally. Um, but as the organization grew, as the, the tech stack got deeper, um, as the teams got a little more specialized, we recognized that it isn't always possible for a team to know exactly how to make these trade-offs globally, especially if there's other teams depending upon their technologies. And so um, from a structural perspective, we started to build platform teams that sort of own some of the lower level shared technologies. And that actually did really help us start to, to carve out the, the dedicated space and time to make some of these longer um, term improvements and staff some of these, these harder projects. I think, I think one thing that people underestimate uh, about tech debt is it's not like, it's not like a, always like a bug where you can just fix it. Sometimes it's like a pretty complex, messy initiative to go and improve a large code base. It takes a lot of grit and perseverance and time. And that's where I think, you know, having these sort of platform teams um, operating on a different cadence can be really helpful in terms of ensuring that you're actually paying down some of the harder issues. Cool. Let's go through one last question. And I'm going to shorten it because the question is, how do you track performance and feature limitation quality issues in your product? That's, I think, one of your first slides that, you know, it's not just bugs. It's also performance quality, um, uh, sorry, and feature limitation. I think we talked about performance. So maybe you can talk about feature limitation. So how do you track feature limitation as part of your quality pro process? Yeah. Where do these uh, come yeah, from? Yeah, so the, the kind of the, the existing bug tracking process at Figma works where a bug gets reported with the title, a severity, which is kind of the user's implied uh, impact, um, a set of reproduction steps, screenshots, all the kind of standard stuff like that. We try to make it as many as few fields as possible, so it's really easy to report bugs. Um, and you can do this directly from Slack, and it, you know you can actually respond in that thread. And we link back to our bug tracking system, so you can come back to Slack. So we try to make it as easy as possible to um, to report these bugs. And then the triage process is is kind of formalized by assigning a priority which is a statement of like when you're going to fix it by. And that enables us to actually measure whether or not teams are actually hitting those SLAs or not and, and help to drive that kind of top-down accountability, but also assigning a bug type. And there's actually probably too many bug types now. I gotta, we got to figure out a way to kind of shorten them again. But the key ones that are used most often are a regression and new bug. Um, so that's like the kind of thing like, oh, we, we actually broke this recently. Let's fix it while it's fresh before it kind of accumulates. Um, there's long-standing bugs, which are bugs that maybe like got introduced yeah. three months ago, but they took a long time. Feature limitations, um, which is the one you're asking about. So a feature limitation is like something that we intentionally didn't do at launch, but maybe after the fact, mm, we realize it's okay. actually pretty important. 
Um, and then we also have like kind of design decisions, like design bugs, stuff like that. So there's, there's a number of different categories. And when we're doing roadmap planning, teams will then use, in our case, we use Asana um, for all this stuff. They'll use Asana to sort of sort these backlogs and, and help them uh, make better prioritization decisions when they're trying to figure out what to do going forward. Um, they'll also use these feature limitations in the quality weeks. So quality weeks are not just about bugs. They're also about improving small aspects of the user experience, making small changes to features to make them better, that sort of thing. Awesome. Cool. Uh, we're right on time. Uh, Chris, it was, it was awesome. It was great. Uh, so much learning. I, I hope everyone in the audience uh, took notes. Um, it's recorded. We're going to publish it and, and send it to everyone. Um, thanks again, Chris, for, for spending that time, uh, for opening up to how things are working at, Fig at Figma. It's, uh, it's fascinating. So, so thanks a lot. 